Hi, Kenny's 4120. Um, welcome to our lecture on adaptations to resistance training or to um, anaerobic training as well as to aerobic training. Um, we're going to talk about some different methods as well as um, what's actually changing with our body when we are um, adapting to different stimuli. So we've gone through already our biomechanics section. So looking at how forces are being applied to the body, um, how our skeletal system is used as levers and our, our joints are set as um, pivot points to create this rotary movement. We've talked about our neuromuscular system, which causes the um, either creation of movement or the resistance of movement. Um, so that we can counteract all of these forces within our environment, as well as we've talked about our cardiorespiratory system, understanding how we transport oxygen and rid CO2, um, which plays a big role when we talk about these anaerobic and aerobic adaptations. Um, we've talked about bioenergetics, we've talked about energy system utilization, um, how we are creating energy based on the intensity or the movement speed, the, the force requirements, and the time requirements within an activity um, or an exercise or training or in a sport. Um, and then we've talked about some of those hormonal responses that are giving us this anabolic reaction or catabolic reaction, either building new tissue or breaking down tissue um, based on the stimulus that's applied. So our first really major principle for this course is the said principle. Um, the said principle um, states that specific adaptation to impose demand or um, saying that the adaptation is specific to what we do. Um, but first we have to talk about this major word here that's kind of the, the key to this entire section is adaptation. Um, so what is an adaptation? Okay, what is this adaptation? What, what's happening? Um, let's, let's clarify that first. In, in biology terms, an adaptation is a change or the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. Okay, so let that kind of sink in, read it over again. The major words here are change in order to become better suited for the environment. So if we think about this in the context of strength and conditioning, we have the organism, which is our athlete. We have the change, which is what's happening physiologically uh, to the body in order to become better suited for the environment, which the environment can be the training space, the field, the court, the pool, the track, whatever the sporting environment is. If we're working with general population clients, the environment could actually be their home environment, their work environment. And maybe it's just the gym because that's where they're most stressed um, or physiologically stressed. So there's a change that helps them become better suited for the environment. So let's come back to here. So we know that um, specific means um, exactly with um, or very special to. Adaptation is that change um, that's happening to make them better suited for the environment. Imposed means pushed onto and demand is what has or the tasks that have to be achieved so specific or going back to the principle of specificity which is very similar similar to the said principle but um, change is specific to the type of training so the specific type of training what we do the stress we place on the athlete that training session that set of 10 squats that um, mile at max effort, those repeat 100 meter sprints um, or 100 yard laps on the pool, the change that is going to occur, the adaptation 
is going to be specific to the type of training that we do. So um, a simple way to put this is you are not going to get maximally stronger from running five miles. Vice versa, you are not going to um, build longer duration endurance by doing um, one rep max squats. It's not going to happen because it's not specific to the type of training. Imposed is the training plan. So this piece, so we have a specific training that's going to cause a specific adaptation to the imposed demands. Imposed is the plan set, for, set forth by the strength and conditioning coach in this sense. So as the strength and conditioning coach, we will impose a training plan onto our athletes um, or a training program or um, a set of exercises, movements, time spaces, intensities, volumes, um, frequency of that training. All of these different variables will go into our program design section. But we are imposing some kind of plan on our athlete or we're pushing it onto them. They have to achieve it. And it's going to be, or the adaptation is going to be specific to that training plan. Um, and that training plan will put a stress or a stimulus on the athlete. So in a wide, broad sense that whatever we put onto the athletes as the strength and conditioning coach, whatever stress we place on them within the training plan, which has to be individual to that athlete, their adaptation is going to be specific to how that stress affects their body. Um, so I know that seems like it's, it's kind of simple. We're just, yeah, we're going to change based on what we do to them. But there's much more when it comes to individualizing training, when it comes to accurately creating this plan in order to get the specific adaptation that we want, not just the specific adaptation that the plan causes. Um, so when we get into our program design section, think back to this. Um, those specific adaptations matter. Okay, so what are the adaptations that we care about as a strength and conditioning coach? The first one is skill, okay, so uh, motor learning, understanding how to perform a movement pattern um, based on whatever the specific sport is or the training. We have speed, which is maximal movement velocity. Um, we're looking at that in all planes of motion, um, both in um, appendage speed, total body speed, swimming speed, running speed, jumping speed, um, throwing speed, swinging speed. Um, this is maximal movement. We are moving as fast as possible. Our next one is power. We talked a little bit about power before in our biomechanics section. Power is the product of force times velocity. So it is, um, think of it as strength combined with speed. Strength is the, the ability to produce maximal force at a specific velocity. Our power is the product of that velocity of movement and the force applied. Um, so how fast we can perform work um, or force over a distance or force times velocity. Power is our key one here for um, sport performance. And because power is a product of force times velocity, we need to understand that developing speed is incredibly important and developing strength is incredibly important to create power. Um, so that's kind of a, a seed there for later on in this in the section. Power really comes from developments in speed and strength. Our next one is hypertrophy, which is um, the development of muscle or increasing the size of a muscle, the cross-sectional area, so making that muscle bigger. Um, if you are interested in things like bodybuilding, hypertrophy is probably what you're most interested in. If we're looking at some sports like um, rugby or football where they're very contact sports, having high levels of hypertrophy can be beneficial not just for force production, but also for defense against collision um, because larger muscle mass gives you more total mass as well as it's um, able to resist that external force, um, especially hypertrophy over joints that are more um, 
mobile or less stable, having larger musculature around the shoulders and the neck um, can protect you when you're tackling someone um, and moving into those odd positions. So this is an increase in total muscle mass. The next one is anaerobic capacity. Um, so this is um, without oxygen, shorter efforts for um, somewhere between one to maybe 90 seconds of work. Um, and I like to categorize these two into single effort and repeated effort anaerobic capacity. Um, so these are really dependent on maximal movement speed, maximal power, strength, kind of these three here. Um, but there's single effort, which think of this as a 100 meter sprint. That is a, a, fa a factor of anaerobic capacity, a 200 meter sprint, a 400 meter sprint. Um, up to about a 600 meter sprint is true anaerobic capacity uh, for a single effort, but that's longer duration. That's more capacity rather than anaerobic power, which is what we'd see with um, something like weightlifting or powerlifting, where you are working with single effort. The capacity is low, but the requirements within that are much higher. And then we have one that is more repeated effort. I think of this as more field court sports uh, because you have to have anaerobic capacity or the ability to perform work or maximal speed, maximal power, recover, and then do it again. So think about sports like soccer um, where you have to maximally sprint down the field, then you walk for a period of time, and then again you have to repeat that same high um, anaerobic power work for longer periods of time. That is anaerobic capacity um, for repeated effort as opposed to for single effort. Um, so if you have to do it once, single effort, if you have to do it multiple times during a sport, um, that would be repeated effort. Um, and the ability to repeat that effort longer is probably going to be better off for you. The last one here, the last one is aerobic capacity, which is probably what you spent more time on in exercise physiology. Um, we have two that we like to split this into is, is lactate threshold and long duration aerobic capacity. Um, lactate threshold is really working at the highest work while maintaining aerobic metabolism as the dominant energy system. So once we pass lactate threshold, we move into more anaerobic uh, energy production, which causes us to accumulate lactate faster. Um, if we stay below lactate threshold, we are able to buffer that lactate at a rate that is possible for our muscles um, to shuttle it out into our uh, cardiovascular system. So we can work that as kind of think of this as high speed aerobic capacity. And we also have long duration aerobic capacity. Um, this is the ability to maintain aerobic metabolism at a higher than resting work rate for long periods of time. So think of this as closer to an hour, two hours, four hours um, of continuous work. Uh, lactate threshold can be maintained for a pretty long time, but not, not as long as long duration but you can maintain close to lactate threshold for upwards of 30 plus minutes. Um, you can work near that zone. So long duration, think of these as marathon, ultra marathon, <coughs> um, Tour de France cycling, um, triathlon, things like that that are more um, the ability to maintain work for long periods of time at submaximal effort. This first one is aerobic capacity. We'll talk about this a little bit later. We'll go a little deeper into the start, but I want to go through a few other ones first. Um, I want to go through these anaerobic adaptations um, and get these kind of in your head because um, these are going to be more of what we talk about in this course. Okay, the first one skill is um, movement, technique, accuracy, precision. Um, this adaptation comes from um, being very fresh and focused on the task at hand. It is less fatiguing from a muscular sense or an energy system sense. 
but it can be very fatiguing from a um, central nervous system sense because you are focusing on very specific movements that you may never have done before. Um, but it is often less fatiguing peripherally or outside of the central nervous system. Um, so something like a skill adaptation could be um, learning how to perform a lunge. That's a, a movement technique. Or you can look at accuracy or precision, being able to throw a medicine ball at a target or um, shoot a basketball at a target if we're looking from a sports sense. We're trying to put it into a point. Or it's a skill of moving just so fast or just so forcefully um, in order to um, make something happen. So maybe it's trying to um, run at a very specific speed. Um, so the skill is actually understanding the pace of the effort. Um, all of these are skill-based adaptations. The next one is speed. So here we're focusing on high movement velocity. So our ability to move either all of us, your arm, your leg, uh, a body part, as fast as it possibly can move. Um, so, for example, this could be running, swimming, cycling. Uh, it can be throwing, kicking, swinging. Anytime where we are trying to move our body as fast as it can possibly move. This is a very neurologically demanding um, adaptation. It's very, very little of speed comes from the musculature. Um, um, besides changing fat, uh, slow to fast switch muscle fiber types, a lot of it comes from firing rate, um, from our central nervous system. So it's, it's not as much, having large muscles does not mean that you have fast muscles, is what I'm trying to say there. Next one, power is the product of force and velocity. So we're trying to have high movement speed with a level of force production. So we're always trying to maximize velocity, but the force that we're producing can only be so great dependent on the velocity. So as velocity gets higher or movement, movement becomes faster, our ability to create concentric force goes down. We talked about that um, in our neuromechanics section. So our ability to create or kind of up that threshold or move that amount of force we can recruit at that specific velocity can improve our power production or by creating faster movement speeds at the same force production increases our power output so it's all about creating that force um, at faster speeds the next one is um, strength this is force our ability to create maximal force um, from a group of muscles within a movement pattern. So think about these as um, heavy training. So um, most of the time resistance training with, with barbells are uh, what we use for strength training um, because it's one of the more effective ways to apply a load or a force onto an athlete in order to build maximal strength or the ability to produce force at any given velocity. Hypertrophy is our increase in muscle size. Um, this is not an increase in the number of muscle fibers. We don't know for sure if that can happen yet. Um, but this is the increase in the size of the muscle either by increasing the cell size itself or increasing the amount of contractile proteins within the muscle fiber. Um, so hypertrophy is associated with strength. So having more muscle mass is associated with more strength potential, um, but it's not one-to-one. -one. Just because your muscle doubled in size does not mean that your strength with that muscle will double in size um, because strength is a product of our nervous system, not just our muscular system. Um, and the last one, anaerobic capacity. Think about these as high workloads for short durations. Um, either individual efforts or repeating efforts. Um, so I kind of repeated what I just talked about, but we need to understand what these are because I'm going to use these terms throughout class. 
Um, and we need to know when I say power, what that means, or when I say strength, what that means. All right, how do we achieve the adaptations? Skill comes from practice and practicing that skill with focused effort on executing whatever skill we're trying to develop. If it's archery, you have to have very focused practice on the movement, the accuracy, and the precision of that skill. Speed comes from moving fast. If you're trying to develop faster sprint speed, you cannot practice your sprints at um, under 92% of your maximum for that distance. Okay? If, you're, if you're training underneath that, you're practicing running slower, your body's not going to get faster. It may actually get slower. Um, so you have to move maximally fast using either low or negative loading. So basically getting assisted movement. So you're moving faster than you could on your own. So we have to move fast to get faster. You cannot move slow and develop speed. Next one, power, it needs to be somewhat fast and somewhat loaded depending on how fast the movement needs to be or how much load needs to be applied. For the sake of sport, most often the load is going to be somewhat constant and we are trying to improve how fast we can move that load. Uh, for example, a uh, basketball player. Power is required for jumping ability, so the ability to produce force down into the ground to project their body up into the air. Their body weight is likely not going to change much throughout the season. However, if they can move their body faster or accelerate themselves to a higher rate and get their body to be moving faster when they get off the ground, they will jump higher, which gives them better chance for rebound, better chance for their shot not to be blocked. Um, so the load is maybe constant, but how fast we move it is being trained. Um, we can also look at that things like shot put. The shot weighs its weight. We have to move it faster in order to get it to go farther. Um, we have to increase its initial velocity when it leaves our hand, because once it leaves our hand, we can't do anything about it. The next one's strength. Um, this is working with heavy load with low number of repetitions is how we train this. So we have to make this heavy above about 85% of your one repetition maximum for that movement pattern. Um, for few repetitions, um, normally that equates to about five repetitions maximum, six, five to six. Um, but it has to be heavy. So you can't build maximal strength without moving maximal-ish resistance. Same with speed, you can't move faster if you don't practice moving fast. Um, these strength, power, speed do fall a little bit into the skill category because it has, or they all have a large neurological component. Um, hypertrophy, we have to train somewhat heavy with um, higher numbers of repetitions. So think about this as um, well, there is evidence that you can really develop hypertrophy at any rep range, but the most effective is um, making it heavy to the point of almost failure for as many repetitions as possible to move heavier resistance. So somewhere between 60 to 90% of your one repetition maximum for as many repetitions as you can perform that exercise. Um, and the heavier it can be, the more tension, the more uh, stress there will be for a hypertrophy adaptation. Um, and last one for building anaerobic capacity. Uh, we have to use shorter duration, high intensity work uh, with a one to one or a one to greater than one work to rest ratio. Um, so that means if I'm doing a 10 second sprint, I need to have at least 10 seconds of recovery or longer to build my anaerobic capacity. Um, or if I'm doing something like, I can also use like a one to 12 ratio, so, or a one to six ratio for the 10 second sprint, a one to six work to rest ratio would be 10 seconds of work, 60 seconds of rest would be a one to six work to rest ratio. Um, we often want longer work to rest ratios to build um, the anaerobic power side, and we want shorter work to rest ratios to build uh, 
the capacity to repeat that same work. Um, but as we've said before, with things like speed, if you lose the high point of the intensity, so if you're not moving as fast as you can, or as, as maximally as you can, you may be dipping into the in, or the aerobic system. It's probably time to shut off that training. We'll talk more about that in implementing training plans. All right. Now let's spend a little time talking about how to build aerobic capacity. Okay. These are all endurance adaptations. These are the abilities to sustain effort for long periods of time. So we can really think of these as endurance sport adaptations. The rest of these are more court field, uh, more explosive sport adaptations. So how do we build lactate threshold or long duration endurance? We have a few different types of training methods. We have things like interval training, which is having a work period, a rest period, a work period, a rest period. We have fartlek, which is using uh, manipulating speed to allow for some recovery um, and some hard effort work. The real difference between a fartlek and an interval is during an interval, you stop work completely. In a fartlek, you lower work. So think about it as you're running, um, you run for one minute and then you jog for 30 seconds, run for one minute. That would be a fartlek because you're playing with the speed of the movement. Interval, an interval for that would be one minute of running, 30 seconds of rest where you are not running. So you cease the effort for a period of time and then come back to it, that's an interval. Fartlek, you are still performing that movement just at a slower rate and then you go back. Tempo is working at high intensities but that those are, that are still under lactate threshold. So you're working for um, near maximal intensities for longer durations. And lastly, long, slow distance, which is what most of you probably think of as the term cardio. I hate that term, don't use that term. Uh, your uh, endurance work at long, slow distances where you're working very submaximally and you're increasing the amount of time that you spend performing that training. Um, interval training is great at developing last lactate threshold because you can work very close to it, recover, and then have another bout of effort that is also close to lactate threshold because you were able to recover. That's one of the great pieces of interval training is the recovery allows you to have more efforts at closer to lactate threshold or closer to maximum speed. Next one, fartlek. Fartlek can help you develop lactate threshold as well as long duration endurance. Um, because you are not ceasing your effort, um, so if it's example running, so I'm using running because that's my background. Um, if you're doing a fartlek for long duration endurance, a fartlek training session could last an hour long. Um, you could be doing something like five minutes of work two minutes of um, recovery, as in five minutes of hard running, two minutes of jogging, and back and forth, back and forth for an hour. That is going to develop your ability to sustain effort for long periods of time. You can also use it to develop lactate threshold. So maybe you're doing two minutes of work, two minutes of rest on your fartlek, and you're working at lactate threshold for all of your work bouts, and you're using those two minutes of jogging as your time to recover so that you can repeat the bout. Um, so think of it as an advanced interval that has more endurance qualities. Interval, think of that as more of a maximal quality. Fartlek, we get maximal, but more endurance qualities. Tempo training can build both. Tempo training is really working for um, a sustained effort at as close to lactate threshold as you can. So we're working near maximal aerobically for longer or extended periods of time. So say you're doing it for 15 minutes at lactate threshold, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, you can turn those into tempo intervals. So you can in 
implement a tempo for maybe a five minutes and then you have two minutes rest and then you do five minutes again. This is more um, half marathon, marathon runner type of training. Uh, but if that tempo is putting you at near lactate threshold because if you want to develop lactate threshold, you have to train just below lactate threshold. You can't train above it and you can't train too far below it or else it will not stimulate your body to change because it is not specific to the imposed demand. The imposed demand has to be near lactate threshold. Um, and lastly, long, slow distance training. So say going for a 10 mile jog or going for um, a two hour bike ride, that is not going to develop your lactate threshold. Okay, it's too submaximal, but it will develop your ability to maintain work for long periods of time. So think of it as long, slow distance training, which is great for baseline uh, or kind of think of it as your bottom level, your base level of aerobic capacity. If you have poor long, slow distance endurance, it's going to uh, work up the chain when it comes to longer duration efforts. Uh, long, slow distance training, probably not the best to benefit high velocity or more anaerobic sports. But if you can't move consistently for 20 to 30 minutes, that's probably going to be an aerobic limitation regardless, even if it's not running or cycling. Um, but constant movement for 20 to 30 minutes should be there for all athletes, uh, even if it's just walking. If you can't walk for 30 minutes straight, there's a bigger problem than your strength or your power. All right. Uh, I'll get off that and back to our said principles. So we've talked about these specific adaptations um, and a little bit about the imposed demands that can create those specific adaptations. So when it comes to resistance training, which we'll talk about now, we're not going to talk about uh, these capacities. We've kind of touched on them. We'll go more into them in our program design sections, um, but you've probably spent enough time on them in exercise physiology and what they are. I want to talk about um, these more anaerobic adaptations that are not your ability to really repeat efforts or your capacity to work in that zone, but more muscular efforts, muscular and neurological efforts. So this is what we're going to really talk about. If this is the, if you want to take a little break um, and, and section out this lecture, this is a good time to do so. Um, if not, let's just keep grinding. Um, so here's our adaptations that we're really going to focus on. Skill, speed, power, strength, and hypertrophy. Skill, remember, is movement technique. Speed is movement velocity. Power is um, applying a force at a specific velocity. Strength is applying high levels of force. And hypertrophy is increasing muscle mass. Okay, these three, skill, speed, and power, come from the neurological system influencing the muscular system okay so if we really think about this these are more neuromuscular adaptations that are more um, dependent on the neurological system okay so you can think about this as um, think back to when you were um, tired or distracted and you were trying to execute a skill like um, we could say even like driving. Um, if you are tired, fatigued, not focused while you're trying to drive, what happens? Bad things, okay, because it influences your neurological system. What if you are, uh, I like to do this with my athletes and, and it, when they decide not to warm up, um, we race them and then they learn that, oh no, I'm slow when I'm not warmed up and then we'll do the next session. We'll actually do a standard warm up, get everything prepared, and then they realize they're faster um, because they've prepared their nervous system to get ready to execute powerful, fast skills. Okay, so what does this come back to? This is kind of review of our neuromuscular system. So it comes down to how fast this signal can be conducted down the nerve. A adaptation to the neurological system from training for especially things like power, speed, skill is the increase 
in the thickness of the myelin sheath, which is, think of that as the insulation for the wire that sends the signal. Uh, so that allows our signal to be conducted faster down the nerve. If we can send that signal faster, we can initiate muscle contraction sooner and with higher levels of force, which means we can recruit larger motor units sooner and we can recruit more motor units. That means faster, more forceful activities, okay? Because we are contracting more muscle fibers, we're contracting them sooner, and with more of a stimulus to contract harder, we are going to become faster and more powerful just because we've improved the neurological system. Okay, we can also look at it from skill pathways. We're able to stimulate just the right number at just the right force for motor units to achieve a skill. Um, so something like uh, shooting a basketball does not require maximal motor unit recruitment. It requires the right amount of motor unit recruitment in order to place the ball in a hoop, especially from larger and larger distances. So think about that. It's not about how much, it's about the right amount uh, when it comes to skill um, and becoming faster having more speed and power comes from the ability to recruit motor units sooner than you could before. Okay, the next ones, uh, power and strength, which we talked about power, there's, there's a very much a neurological component because of the speed aspect, but there's also a muscular aspect of strength and hypertrophy is strictly muscular. Hypertrophy uh, you do not really grow muscle by doing skill-based work. Okay? That's how we can think about it. Muscle does not get bigger from doing technical skill. Muscle gets bigger from stressing the muscle. Okay? Um, some of the benefits of strength training, resistance training, also for more of the neuromuscular system, so where those two meet, we depolarize at a lower threshold, which means those big high threshold motor units we talked about before that take a lot to turn on, now it takes a little bit less, a little bit less and a little bit less um, as we train, which means that we're able to recruit not just motor units sooner, but high threshold motor units sooner. If we recruit high threshold motor units sooner, we produce faster speeds, more force, better sport performance in most sense. Okay. If we look at it within the muscle itself, the transverse tubules is where we have the communication between the cells. Uh, those become more efficient. We're able to store calcium and distribute calcium at faster rates. We're more sensitive um, to that calcium, which means that the muscle will contract sooner after that stimulus is applied. Remember we talked about how um, when calcium is dispersed into the sarcoplasm, it attaches to um, troponin, which moves it over so tropomyosin is available so we can begin having myosin perform power strokes. We become more sensitive to that calcium, which means those cross bridge sites become available sooner. They're available sooner, we can start that contraction sooner, move faster. Okay. So think back here, if we can shorten those sarcomeres at a faster rate or closer to the time we decide to shorten, or that, that think of that time space between when I decide to contract and when the contraction starts becomes shorter, I will become faster and more forceful. And if I can recruit more motor units, that means more muscle fibers, more possible strength or more force production at those faster speeds, okay? So if we think back to the sliding filament theory, we have these myosin, they attach and pull, it detach, attach and pull. If we're able to start this process sooner, we can produce more force at higher velocities. So that's the benefits within the muscular system. Now let's talk about hypertrophy. Yeah, hypertrophy is what everyone loves. So if you're a 
um, throw in the gym and you just want to get jacked, hypertrophy is your plan. Okay, you want to make your muscle fibers bigger, to make your whole muscles bigger, uh, to increase the, maybe it's the aesthetic, maybe it's you want to get stronger so you need some more muscle mass in order to get stronger because you've kind of maxed out that neurological component. Okay, we want to get bigger muscles. How do we do that? Well, first we have to uh, really add more myosin to that myosin filament or in another sense, add more proteins. Okay, what do we talk about as our anabolic reaction for muscle growth? It's muscle protein synthesis or synthesizing new proteins to go into the muscle. Myosin and actin are built with proteins. So that's why if you're thinking about the nutrition side and you say you have to eat more protein, which I'll talk about and why protein is so important, uh, we want to add more proteins within the muscle fiber okay, so it becomes bigger because we have to make space for it as well as it becomes stronger because now there's more myosin able to attach to actin so we can produce more force per power stroke because we have more that are assisting in that movement so here's kind of a little visual of what happens with hypertrophy especially uh, myofibular hypertrophy, which is increasing the um, the individual um, myofibrils within the muscle fiber. Okay, so each myofib myofibril has one myosin and six actin around it. Okay, so think of these as individual sarcomeres and we sliced them in half. And this is your muscle before strength training. So maybe you just started this class, you haven't lifted some weights in a while, you've been taking a break, um, and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to start strength training because I see all of these awesome benefits. Wink, wink, start strength training. Okay. One of the benefits, or when we, we start training, especially for the focus of hypertrophy, or if you're just brand new to training, we increase the number of myosin within that myofibril bigger myosin, now what happened? Oh no, that myosin's really close to actin. It's really close. There's probably not a lot of space for grabbing and sliding. We're just kind of cramped in here. It's like when you have a really tiny apartment and you're living with like four other people like I did uh, in college, that was rough. Um, you don't like that. Okay, you gotta get rid of it. You gotta make some more space, okay? So our muscle's going to increase the size to allow space for cross bridging. So now it's more space. It looks just like a bigger version of what we saw before. Now those more myosin can really work hard to create more force and become stronger. Uh, so therefore, hypertrophy training increases muscle size. Um, if you want more on hypertrophy training, let me know and I can send you some other references for that. Uh, with pination angle, we talked about this in our biomechanics section. Um, this is the arrangement of muscle fibers. With maximal strength training, a heavy, heavy strength training, pennate muscles will become more pennate, or they'll, they'll change that angle in order to fit or make that muscle fiber larger, um, or that group of muscle fibers larger. Fusiform muscles, when we train especially eccentrics or speed, they become more fusiform or longer. So those fascicles become more in line with the tendon so that they can shorten faster. So we even get some pination or some, some fiber orientation along the tendon changes when it comes to training. So heavy training, we get more uh, arrangement closer to what's favored for strength, maximal strength, when we do things that are faster especially heavy, fast, and with a lot of eccentric action, um, we get kind of this more in-line position of the muscle fibers so that they can shorten sooner. A fusiform muscles, really good at resisting eccentric contractions or, or being able to contract quickly to stop movement. Think hamstrings, biceps. We'll talk more about those a little later. Okay. If we think back to the size principle like we talked about earlier, with all of these motor units, all of these 
have a lower threshold for activation, which means we can recruit um, bigger motor units sooner to create more force. We also increase the size of type two muscle fibers through hypertrophy to a greater extent than type one muscle fibers. Type two muscle fibers are more prone to hypertrophy um, or an increase in size, while type one muscle fibers are uh, more prone to an increase in capillarization and mitochondrial density. They can get larger, but they don't have the capacity to get as large as the type two fibers. Okay, they're, they're going to be smaller because that's their job. Um, they need to be, but we can increase the size of all of these and we can lower the activation threshold for all of these fibers in order to increase our ability to produce force sooner. So coming back to this, um, skill is primarily neurological. Speed is primarily neurological. There's a little bit of, of muscular component there. Um, fiber orientation, if you have more fusiform muscles that can aid to speed. Um, if you have more muscle mass, maybe, um, but most of the time speed is a very neurological component. If you have better elasticity within the connective tissue, that can help, um, but it's primarily neurological when it comes to us controlling speed. Power comes from neurological components as well as muscular components. Um, so it's more, more neurological. So that's first is our ability to recruit those motor units sooner. But if we have larger motor units that we're re we are recruiting sooner, our force threshold is going to go up. Next, strength. Strength is muscular with neurological. You can't be, you can't have giant, large hypertrophied muscles um, and not be able to actively activate those muscles well and be strong. So if there is a neurological component to strength, that should not be overlooked. Just because someone is larger in muscle mass does not mean that they are necessarily stronger, but if they have the ability to neurologically control it, Absolutely. Um, that's why most sports have weight classes. Um, so people who are uh, higher in muscle mass don't compete against those that are lower in muscle mass uh, in strength or combat sports. Okay. And lastly, hypertrophy is primarily muscular. It really comes down to the muscle, increasing the size of the muscle. Um, that's what we care about here with hypertrophy. Not all sports require all of these. Um, for example, hypertrophy was something that we tried to avoid uh, when I was training sprinters um, because if they added more weight, it would slow them down. So we were trying to work in this more neurological factor, a little bit of muscle for the um, injury prevention side, but um, minimizing hypertrophy. Uh, while now I'm working with um, high school and college baseball players that are um, undersized, Hypertrophy and strength are a huge goal and, and speed and power are put a little bit more on the back burner uh, because these are the goals at the time. Okay, now let's come back. This is kind of the last thing we really have to talk about is the force velocity relationship and how this matters for us. Our job as strength and conditioning coaches is to shift the force velocity curve to the right. Write that down, star it. It's going to be an, an exam question. Know this. Okay, we're trying to shift the curve to the right. This curve tells us at each individual velocity, this is the maximum force that muscle can produce. Okay, as velocity goes down, force potential goes up. As force potential goes down, or as velocity goes up, force potential goes down. Okay, so maximal speed does not correspond with maximal force. If we can shift that curve to the right, now at the same speed, I'm producing more force or at faster speeds, I'm producing the same force. Okay, I'm moving faster, closer to maximum and my maximum probably went up. So now what I can move maximally um, at very slow velocities is going to be higher. So I built more strength. In the center area, I'm building more power. So regardless of the force, I've increased the velocity at which I can produce it. Okay, how is this helpful? 
it allows us to produce more force at higher speeds, or it allows us to produce higher forces as well as produce higher velocities. Um, it helps us all the way along this spectrum. Okay, and this all comes from progression. Our ability to progress our body or adapt and then adapt to a new stimulus. Everything works for training until it doesn't. Hey, that's a quote from Louis Simmons, one of a famous powerlifting coach. Hey, you have to specifically impose an adaptation once that stimulus or that demand no longer causes the specific adaptation you are looking for, you have to change the demand that you impose on the athlete to get the adaptation now. Because once they've adapted, so here's Milo here, if he's holding this little calf, hey, that's a stress for him when he is 15, but now that he's um, maybe 27, he's been carrying that cow for years, Okay, this calf would not stimulate any type of growth for this Milo. As well as if this Milo tried to pick up this cow, he's not picking it up. So the demand has to be um, particular to or specific to the individual that you're imposing it, as well as it has to be enough to cause an adaptation. All right, um, here are your review questions. Okay, what is the said principle and why is it important? Describe each of our seven major adaptations. List and describe the neuromuscular adaptations. List and describe muscular only adaptations. Um, describe where each of the five neuromuscular adaptations come from. Okay, think about where in the body um, and explain why we want to shift the force velocity curve to the right. Why is that so important? All right, thank you for watching and I'll see you in class.